In this video, we're going to talk about the most fundamental unit of calculation in quantum computing, which is the qubit. Now, the qubit has a number of special properties that we're going to go into that makes it a lot different than classical bits, um, the fundamental unit of calculation in classical computing. So to start off, let's look at exactly what a classical bit is. Now, what a classical bit is, is just the, the units of operation that a classical computer uses to make calculations. So a bit is either a zero or a one, and it's on a, a circuit. And by applying logical gates to these circuits, we can end up making calculations. We can compute uh, the solution to different algorithms and problems that we have. Now, what a qubit is, is it's similar to a bit except for the fact that it can be in superposition. That is to say, it can be in multiple states at once. It can be either a zero or a one at the same time in parallel universes. So this is represented by this equation, which is ket phi equals alpha ket zero plus beta ket one. And the alpha and beta in this circumstance is just the, the probability wave, the, the uh, wave that determines whether it is a 0 or a 1. Now, each of these different probability waves um, has to equal 1. When we take the, the square of them, the probability has to equal 1. That is to say the qubit has to be something. It's, it's just not uh, nothing. So to help clarify the idea of superposition, what I'm going to do is build a very simple circuit on the quantum simulator. So what I'm going to do is apply a single instance of a Hadamard gate, which I'll explain a bit more in the next video. But what it does is put a qubit into superposition, so that if we were to run this circuit, we see that we have an expectation value of 50% for measuring a 0, and an expectation value also of 50% for measuring a 1. So what that means if is if we were to run the experiment a thousand times, roughly 500 of our measurements would be zero and roughly 500 of our measurements would be one. Now, why is it doing this? This is because when we put the qubit into superposition, what's happening is that it is both a zero and a one in parallel universes at the same time. And when we do our final measurement, we break the wave function down so that it collapses to either a 0 or a 1. And in different universes, we're going to get different measurements. So in half the universes, we'll measure a 0, and in the other half, we'll measure a 1. And really, we have no way of knowing which universe we're going to be in. It seems to be completely random. Now, to get a better understanding of exactly what it means for a qubit to be in superposition. So we're going to look at an experiment called the beam spinner experiment. Now, how it works is these gray lines, they are the beam splitters. They're essentially lenses that split a beam so that it goes uh, to the, the right in 50% of the universes, and it goes up in the other half of the universes. Um, and when this happens, it means that the qubit has gone from being sharp to unsharp. It is now, it has a certain probability of being in either possible universe. Now, these black lines, these are essentially mirrors, so the qubits bounce off of these mirrors. Now, when they come back to this uh, final beam splitter, you might expect that the qubits would once again uh, branch off into different universes. But what ends up happening is that these qubits interfere with each other in different parallel universes to become sharp again and hit this beam splitter. So if we were to watch that from the beginning, the qubits become, um, the qubits become unsharp. When they hit the final beam splitter, they combine and become sharp again. So only this beam detector, or this photon detector, will uh, register anything. 
Now, when we add a barrier into this experiment so that it blocks the qubit um, on the upper side, we see what happens is that after becoming sharp, instead of the photon now bouncing off to the right like it did last time, it once again splits off into different parallel universes. Now, this notion of a qubit being able to be in different parallel universes at the same time might seem a bit counterintuitive and a little bit uncomfortable. It seems counterintuitive because when you look at the universe, there is only one reality happening at one time. There's not multiple versions of me in this universe giving different video tutorials. There's only one me. But when we look at what quantum theory seems to imply, it's that there is multiple versions of me giving different video tutorials in different universes, in different versions of me who have a completely different interest in computer science. Now, this notion also might seem a little bit uncomfortable because you have like a difficult time accepting just how insignificant you are in the vast expansion of the universe. Now you have to deal with being insignificant for the fact that there's many different universes with many different versions of you. But despite this, um, the beauty or the, the intriguing part of a cube being able to be in superposition is that we're able to exploit this to make calculations in parallel universes that can speed up algorithms much faster than what can be done on a normal classical computer. So that's uh, some of the properties of qubits. And in the next couple of video tutorials, I'll be explaining more about how we use these qubits to make calculations and to solve algorithms.